This really is a familiar story, I think. This story of the Magi who come from the east to visit the Christ child in Bethlehem. Biblical scholars tell us that they were probably Persian astrologers. They had been watching the skies and, and, and the stars for a long, long time, waiting for some sign from God that the Messiah child had been born. And then they see the star in the east. And so they head from Persia to Jerusalem, which is about a thousand miles. Find their way to Jerusalem, ask there where the Christ child is, and Herod, upon hearing that they're looking for the Christ child, himself wants to find where this child is because he wants to kill him. And so he says to the Magi, be sure and tell me when you find him where he is so I too can come and worship him. They then head the nine miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, find Mary, Joseph, and the baby, who by this time, by the way, are in a house, and present to him their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And then Matthew says, having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they return by a different route. It's a great story, isn't it? Well, I want this morning to draw from that story five insights for your spiritual journey this year and five insights for my spiritual journey this year. Five insights for our personal spiritual journeys in 2014. First of all, God is always seeking to guide us and to lead us, always. Now the chances of you seeing a star in the east that is going to be God's guidance in your life is pretty slim. And the chances that you're going to have some dramatic experience by which God leads you is probably pretty slim too. But the fact is, every single day of your life and every single day of my life, God is seeking to lead us and to guide us. One person said that there are five essential ways God can and wants to lead us, and I like this. He can help us make right decisions instead of wrong decisions. He can guide us to find encouragement amidst discouragement. He can lead us to right relationships instead of wrong relationships. He can guide us to good actions and away from bad actions. He can lead us to discover open doors when we experience closed doors. I really like that. The fact is that God does seek to lead and guide you and me every single day. And so perhaps one of the resolutions we need to make this year is this, that we will commit more time to prayer, more time to biblical discernment, and more time to spiritual reflection so indeed God can lead us and guide us. Second insight, God's work takes place in the real world. God's work takes place in the real world. Now, contrary to the placid scenes that you and I have on our uh, Christmas cards and in our nativity scenes, the birth of Christ took place in a rather dark and somber world. We have these wonderful Christmas scenes that, again, I would describe as placid, but the fact is that the birth of Christ took place in a rather dark and somber world. You see, Rome had its foot upon the Palestinian people. And there were oppressive taxes that had to be paid. And so when we read in Luke 2 that Mary and Joseph are coming to Bethlehem to pay taxes, they're coming to pay a tax they can't afford as a poor young couple. And then we read in Matthew 2 that Herod decides in order to get rid of this Christ child that he's going to kill all children two years of age and under. That was a world of suffering and a world of darkness in a world of brutality. And I guarantee you that people at that time were asking the question, where is God in the midst of this suffering? Where is God when an authoritarian nation can occupy us? Where is God uh, when there are such oppressive taxes? Where is God when a king to decide he's going to kill all children two years of age? And where is God in this darkness? Well, our world is kind of dark, too, if you think about it. There's a lot of suffering in this world, isn't there? There's a lot of brutality in this world. There are authoritarian figures in this world who can't wait but to put their foot upon some other people or some other nation. And so we've got folks in our own time asking the same question that people of the first century ask, where is God in the midst of all this darkness? One of the convictions you and I have to have this year as people of faith is that God is at work for good. The world may say otherwise. Headlines may say otherwise. 
The news you see may say otherwise. And we should not ignore that suffering, by the way. But the fact is, we must believe with deep conviction that God is at work in this world for good. If there's anything the world needs, it's a people who have hope that things aren't always going to be the way they are or seem to be. That there are people who do believe that God is ever working for what is good and just and right. And we should be that people. We should be the ones who go forth into this world in 2014 while not ignoring the suffering of the world, say there's more to this story. Pay attention to the good. Pay attention to the things that are stirring within the world that are positive. Pay attention to the good things God is doing. Third insight, the wise men made a great commitment and so should we. I'm not sure the average one of us really appreciates the sacrifice that these wise men, these Persian astrologers made. Again, as I said earlier, it was a thousand miles from Persia to Jerusalem, a thousand miles. Now we're not talking about a thousand miles by car and expressway. We're talking about a thousand miles over treacherous terrain on camel and or on foot. And the chances are most scholars say that it took several months for them to, to travel from Persia uh, to Jerusalem. That, that was quite a journey, quite a sacrifice. They were so determined to see the Christ child and to connect with him that they made a great sacrifice. One of my favorite theologians of another time is the Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard. And he says the problem with many of us who claim to believe in Jesus is that we fall under the category of adherence, admirers, or worshipers but not followers. And he says, one of the things we need to understand, Jesus is not asking for more believers. He's not asking for more adherents. He's not asking for more admirers. He's not asking for more worshipers. He's asking for followers, people called disciples. And so I think one of the questions for you and for me this coming year is where do we fit in that? I'm glad you admire Jesus. I'm glad you're here to worship Jesus. I'm glad you're an adherent to that faith that we call the Christian faith. But the bottom line, my friends, for me as well as for you, is is this year, 2014, going to be a year in which we really follow this Jesus? And to follow Him is to commit ourselves to His life, to His teachings, and to His way. Fourth insight. We should be sensitive to spiritual seekers. We need to be sensitive to spiritual seekers. After all, if you think about it, the wise men, the magi, were really spiritual seekers, weren't they? They were on a spiritual quest. They, as astrologers, as I said earlier, were studying the stars, studying the sky, wanting to find some sign that the Christ child was being born and that they could get to Him. And so they were spiritually seeking connection with the Messiah. And I want to tell you this morning, there are a lot more people who are spiritually seeking in our culture than you may think. We hear all this news, and it's real, about the number of people who are detached from, from the Christian faith and or any faith altogether. But the fact is, I'm going to tell you, our culture is full of people who are seeking some anchor in their life, some foundation for their life, some place they can hang their spiritual hat that has, spirit, that has meaning for their life. I read a really insightful article just a few weeks ago about Kristen Powers. I don't know if you know the name Kristen Powers or not. She's a noted uh, political commentator and columnist. Uh, uh, previously worked, I think, for the New York Times. I think now she's on Fox Network. But she wrote an article about her journey from atheism, agnosticism, atheism, to Christian belief. And I want to share part of it with you. I grew up in the Episcopal Church, but my belief was superficial and flimsy. It was barred from my father. Leaning on my father's faith got me through high school, but by college it wasn't enough. From my early 20s on, I would waver between atheism and agnosticism, never coming close to considering that God could be real. On one occasion, a friend asked me if I had in mind the person I wanted to date. I replied, just nobody who is religious. But then I began to date a man who was a Christian, and decided to go to church with him, mainly to please him. Over time, however, I began to read the Bible. 
I came to conclude that the weight of evidence was on the side of Christianity and not agnosticism or atheism. But I didn't feel any connection to God. But through some personal experiences, I began to feel God everywhere. At the advice of a mentor, I entered a Bible study group and, realizing, and began to realize again, Christianity is true. I spent the next few months doing my best to wrestle away from God. It was pointless. Everywhere I turned, there God was. Slowly there was less fear and more joy. God had pursued me and caught me, whether I liked it or not. Again, I want to emphasize to each of us this morning, when you leave this place and you go into your neighborhoods and into your work settings and into your daily lives, you are going to interface with far more people who are spiritually seeking than you may think. And perhaps all they need from us is a nudge, an invitation, as this woman got an invitation, an invitation to come to church, an invitation to join a Bible study, the sharing of a personal story done lovingly and non-judgmentally. I guarantee you that you're going to have profound opportunity in the coming parts of this, early parts of this year to meet a spiritual seeker who is just waiting for somebody to be the inviter. May it be you and me. And finally, I would say this morning, like the Magi, we need to take a different route. I love this part of the story. It's riveting to me. Now keep in mind, Herod says he's going to kill all children two years of age and under. The wise men don't know this at the point. The Magi don't know this. They do know that Herod wants to see the Christ child. But in a dream, they're warned to return to Persia by another route. By another route. I don't know what different route you need to take this year or what different route, uh, I know what route I need, different route I need to take this year, but I want to be clear. Every single one of us in this sanctuary, preachers included, needs a different route this year. There's some part of your life and there's some part of my life that is not what God wants it to be. There's some level of commitment in your life and some level in my, of commitment in my life that's not what it ought to be. Every single one of us, as we enter into 2014, are called to a different path, a different route, a different way of doing things. I, again, I don't know what it is in your life. I know what it is in mine. And God wants us to take, as the wise men did, a different route this year, whatever that is. You know, it's the interesting thing about resolutions. We talk a lot about them this time of year, and we, we joke a lot about them, about making resolutions and not keeping them. And one of my favorite is the New Year prayer one man prayed. Here's his prayer. Dear God, so far this has been great. I haven't gossiped about my friends. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, cruel, or rude. I'm very thankful. But in a few minutes, Lord, I'm going to get out of bed. And from then on, I'm probably going to need a lot more help to get through the new year. You got to start somewhere, right? If we want to commit to seeking God's guidance faithfully and fully this year, we got to start somewhere. If we want to commit to seeing the goodness of God amidst the darkness of the world, we got to start somewhere. If we want to commit to, to being true followers and not just admirers, we've got to start somewhere. If we want to commit to encouraging spiritual, spiritual seekers whom we encounter our lives, we've got to start somewhere. And if we want to walk a different path, a different route, we've got to start somewhere. What better place than right here at this altar? On the first Sunday of 2014, as you take these elements to start anew on a journey to be more of the person that Christ would have each of us be. Right here at this altar is a great place to start the journey. Thanks be to God. Amen.